Hey everyone, this is Nick, and today we're going to talk about GNOME. And GNOME has been taking steps to be a more developer-friendly platform. It's, it's been a while now. They've been working on their App Store, which is now more developer-friendly in terms of look and feel and how apps are discovered. They have split everything related to the GNOME user interface guidelines into Libet Vita, and they are not in GDK anymore. And they're also going to limit theming capabilities to ensure that developers have a stable platform they can target so they can make better apps. We've heard a lot of things about these topics, some misinformed, some true, and some completely weird. So we're gonna take a look at the actual facts. Let's begin. Now, all the information in this video is coming directly from either GNOME developers, theme developers, distribution leads, either from questions that I asked them and they answered, or from blog posts that they made publicly available. Some of these interviews were actually super interesting, so I will leave a link to the transcript of each of those in the description, as well as any blog post I use. They're really worth a read. So let's begin with what GNOME is actually doing. So we've heard that GNOME wants to be a platform and that they want to limit theming to ensure that this platform can be as stable for developers as possible, and that their solution to do that is libadvita. So is there any truth to that? Well, Christian Schaller, the director for desktop at Red Hat, confirms. I think that is true in the sense that it has been a long-held belief in the GNOME community that you cannot make a great desktop if you treat your desktop operating system as a layer cake. So can this be a challenge for distributions? It definitely can be, as it means that the desktop will have expectations on your system as a whole, and if you want to go a different way, it might take quite a bit of work. Now, on the topic of theming, Alexander Mikhailenko and Chris Davis, two GNOME contributors, also confirm that the will is to limit theming to a maximum. Theming as we know it for GDK apps won't be supported by libadvita, and it's highly unlikely that there will be any API for loading arbitrary style sheets. Okay, but what is libadvita? And here again, Chris and Alexander answer. Libadvita means that you have a well-defined target for developing apps. Historically, this has been a bit all over the place, but here you have a single library in line with a HIG, providing widgets implementing it, or styles it mentions, in just one package. Now this basically means that libadvita removes all the guesswork for a developer that wants to implement a specific control or widget, instead of trying to copy-paste it from another app or look where it might be implemented and waste some time, he can pick it right up from libadvita or develop their own control immediately. Now libadvita brings advantages to GNOME as well. It means we can iterate on the look and feel faster, Previously, when we wanted to change the look of GNOME, we had to change the default look of GTK. But we are not the only consumers of GTK. So for GNOME, libadvita means that they can change the style and the look and feel of GNOME faster without any risk of breaking GTK itself for other desktops that use GTK, like for example Elementor iOS or Budgie. Now finally, GNOME developers also think that libadvita brings advantages to GNOME users. Now we can put GNOME-specific widgets like that in libadvita and leave GTK alone so it's more neutral. Inside GNOME, you get better and more consistent apps. Look at settings and how it has million different list row styles, sometimes different within the same page. So basically, GNOME users can expect more coherent applications because developers know how to implement a specific design pattern which is already available in libadvita instead of reinventing the wheel each time they want to do something cool. So in a nutshell, what GNOME is doing is taking all the user interface related stuff from GTK and moving it into libadvita, where theme developers and distribution maintainers can't really touch it. But the benefits are that GNOME can iterate faster on the look and feel of GNOME without breaking GTK for other developers. Developers can now have access to all the widgets that they might want to use or know that something doesn't exist and create their own implementation. And users can have more coherent applications as well. But why is theming such a problem, and why can't GNOME developers just let users replace themes inside of libadvita, like what distributions and users have been doing for years now? So theming on GNOME and GDK has long been called a hack, and that's kinda true, it was basically taking the CSS style sheet baked inside of GDK and replacing it by something else. So Alexander and Chris have the explanation. Say you're a developer and need to know the current accent color. How would you do that? You can check public colors themes expose and get theme selected background color because it's blue in Advita. Then you try it on elementary and find out it's half transparent there. Or that some theme doesn't even export it. After all, it's not an API and there are zero guarantees that it's there. 
Or maybe it's exported, but it's a bogus color that doesn't match anything in the UI at all. Maybe you can render a widget and check its background color like a checkbox. Oh, but it's a gradient, not a flat color. Or maybe the whole thing is a PNG image. There's no way to check anything in that case. So basically, themes are more CSS frameworks than themes, where you have hundreds of ways of achieving the same result and virtually no way to check that everything is done in the same way. And Cassidy from Elementor iOS is on the same boat. With Elementor iOS, for example, we often see people who switch out their system style sheet get upset when there is poor contrast, broken widgets, or features that no longer work for them. We also see third-party apps that are doing interesting custom widgets completely break because some unsupported style sheet doesn't support the variables or style classes they depend on to make it easier to make their app. And of course, other desktops have theming solutions that are more robust than what GNOME has been using, like KDE or GNOME 2, but these things can also break. And in the case of GNOME, it was never intended to be a theming implementation. It was a hack that people decided to use to theme the desktop, but it was never really supported. Okay, so what are the impacts of all these changes? And on the distribution theming side, I spoke to a Yaru developer which preferred to stay anonymous. Libidvita really makes it very easy for app developers to build with GTK. The thing about it being end of distro and user theming is a conclusion derived on the current state of Libidvita. It's in alpha state and many of the features are being actively developed and worked. Currently, the main priority and focus of Libidvita is to land proper support for universal dark preference for GNOME 42. I can't say what Ubuntu Desktop will do regarding this, but I can confidently share that Yaru is 100% compatible with Libadvita GDK4, especially now that we dropped the mixed theme. So for theme developers, it seems that if their stuff is close to Advita, it is possible to maintain 100% compatibility. And that's just me thinking about this, but this means that distributions that have such a theme could probably ship a patched version of Libadvita, including their own theme instead of the Advita one but there might be other complications. Now for distributions that use GDK but not GNOME, the impacts also seem pretty minimal. Cassidy from Elementor iOS explains them. In the past, GDK may have forced GNOME-style dialogues or layouts that we had to work around. By adding these GNOME-specific widgets and utilities to Libadvita rather than GTK, it keeps GDK itself more neutral and more flexible for desktops like Elementor iOS. And at the same time, there are some intriguing bits of Libadvita, especially around multi-touch gestures and animation, coming from its history as LibHandy, which we're using heavily in Elementor iOS today. So I could see us using Libadvita in future elementary software. And because we're in constant collaboration with GNOME contributors, that won't be an issue for us. We will be able to use the bits that make sense, while basically ignoring GNOME-specific design bits. Now, other distribution and developers aren't as enthusiastic though. Joshua Strobel, which is the experience lead for Solus, which ships Budgie as a default desktop based on GDK and GNOME, he writes in a blog post, Linux users have long enjoyed the degree to which they are able to personalize their desktop apps and environments through theming, a tradition dating back to long before I even started using Linux. Reasonable expectations like these are being completely turned on their head by GNOME. This is being done by requiring vendors like Solus and System76 to develop their own libraries to handle styling of their own specific applications. Through their enforcement of the Advita theme in Libadvita, they are eliminating both developer and user choice in the process. I'll leave a link to the blog post in the description of this video. Joshua has since announced that they would be moving Budgie from GDK to the Enlightenment Foundation libraries and they will keep a GNOME image, but it will be vanilla GNOME because they can't ensure that they provide a good experience in their eyes. Now the question is, are themes really that important? Because in the proprietary OS world, most of them don't have it. Windows, Mac OS, Android and iOS, apart from a dark mode and accent colors in some cases, you can't really change anything. For distributions though, theming is branding, but not for all of them. Christian Schaller from Red Hat told me, in a situation where you have multiple distributions sharing a desktop solution, the question of how do you make your options stand out comes up a lot. So for instance, if someone posts a screenshot of their Linux system online, the line of thought is that we should try to come up with ways to ensure that users right away recognize that as our system. And theming, for instance, is a tempting path to go down to do that. We have decided to focus our diversification on being the technology leader, with projects such as Pipewire, Wayland, and Bolt, instead of spending a lot of time on trying to color the UI Fedora Blue. 
Other distros, of course, will use theming as a differentiator on top of their tweaks and extensions that they apply to GNOME. Now, for users, I can only speak for myself, but for me, themes are extremely important. They're an essential way to make my desktop look like what I want to use and basically change it up and be more fun. Now, for Elementor iOS, that's where accent colors come in. First, aesthetics, or as I like to call it, making it your own. People want to make their computer feel like theirs, just like they might want to decorate their physical desk with their own style to make it more pleasing for them. The second major aspect is accessibility, which encompasses contrast and light dark style preferences. Some people have an easier time using their computer if it temporarily or permanently looks different than the defaults. From the elementary perspective, we're tackling the first two aspects differently than just arbitrary themes. We've added a dark style preference and app API to address the aesthetic and accessibility needs for a dark interface while ensuring it's well supported by apps. We've even had success moving this under the free desktop banner via a portal API, and now future GNOME versions will be shipping a compatible API as well. We've also added 10 new accent colors to Elementor iOS and a refreshed style sheet that uses them throughout the OS in places like highlighted text, selected options, suggested actions, focus glows, and even accented text like in the date and time indicator. Now, still on the topic of theming, we heard about a coloring API that would let distros or users or developers change the colors of every element of the UI. So is there any truth to that? And Chris and Alexander from Grome answer this. Nothing is set in stone, so don't rely on anything happening. But there have been talks of supporting different accent colors on a system level. We're also planning to work with Canonical on leveraging our planned recoloring support into an API for vendors to set specific colors. And there are at least two more ways to sideload the theme anyway. They are just more clearly unsupported. So it seems that there is at least a willingness to let distributions change up the colors to retain a bit of branding on their distributions. And apparently there are still ways that a user could completely change the theme if that's what they want to do. Now the anonymous Yaru contributor chimes in on this topic as well. Currently, the coloring API is built around the choice of an app developer. There is no option provided for distributions and it will be offered in the future. With GDK3, we have quite a number of tweaks on top of Advaita to make it look Yaru. Now with libadvaita, we essentially just recolor controls as everything else is very, very, very close to Yaru's point of view as most things Yaru did are already present in upstream. Now it's important to note that application developers seem like they will have the upper hand with the coloring API and that any choices that they decided will supersede what the distribution or what the user could have set. So I asked around to see if it could break cohesiveness or interoperability for various desktops. And here again, Chris and Alexander answer. This, of course, depends on what you call interoperability. For example, take GNOME and Elementary. If you expect being able to run GNOME apps on Elementary and the other way without breaking them, Yes, it's getting better in this regard. If you're expecting GNOME apps to look like elementary apps or the other way, then no, it doesn't work this way. Cassidy from Elementary OS said, I don't believe surface level consistency is a worthwhile ultimate goal. If I was shipping an Android app, I would design and write it using native Android patterns and tech. If I were shipping an iOS app, I would do so with native iOS tooling and patterns. I wouldn't expect my Android app to look consistent on iOS and vice versa. In the same way, I don't expect a KDE or GNOME app to be consistent on Elementor iOS. Even if it were using the same colors on Surface, the way those platforms look and work are just different. So basically, what we're seeing here is a shift in how Linux is viewed as a platform. Basically, it's not viewed as a platform at all. The platform is now GNOME, Elementor iOS, or KDE, or Cinnamon. And while you can run an application designed for one platform on another, they won't look and feel the same. You don't write a Linux app, you write a GNOME app, you write an elementary app or a KDE app. So to conclude this lengthy video, what is actually happening and what are the impacts? GNOME has decided to make GDK more neutral. They took everything that is user interface related and moved it into a specific library that can't really be modified by vendors unless they want to fork it. Application developers will be able to target this specific library if they want GNOME's design patterns. And other applications that don't want GNOME design patterns can still use GDK and use their own libraries if they want to implement other styles and widgets. Now, this comes at the price of vendor or distribution theming. 
Basically, unless vendors or distributions want to ship a forked version of libadvita and force every app to link to that instead of the default libadvita, they won't be able to change the default look and feel of their distribution based on GNOME. Now that future isn't set in stone though, because we can see that talks are happening between GNOME and Ubuntu so that the coloring API that is being worked on will let distributions recolor the controls of the various widgets that Advita uses. Now they won't be able to completely change the button shapes and the widget shapes, but at least they will be able to have some branding through the colors, and that won't break applications. And users will still have ways to change the whole style sheet on their desktop, which means they still have ways to theme. They're just more clearly unsupported than what was provided before. Now these user-themed desktops will still lack coherence compared to what we have today, because app developers can enforce some specific colors and can enforce the use of Advita, which the user won't be able to do anything about. So yes, we will lose in terms of coherence and consistency on our systems with this change. Now, will the trade-off be worth it? Only time will tell. As for myself, I have been a strong proponent for theming, and I have opposed this change publicly on Twitter a while ago. Now, I'm not so sure anymore. I'm thinking that the advantages might outweigh the problems, but we'll have to see in the future how this is implemented, how the coloring API works, how the user changing of themes work. It's not set in stone, it's not done yet. So. Basically, these are the facts about what's happening and what the impacts are. I'll let you make your own opinion about this. Now, this video was made possible by Slimbook, and you probably very likely know already all about Slimbook if you're watching this channel. They are a computer manufacturer based in Valencia, Spain. They make Linux laptops, Linux desktops. I use their desktop and their laptop exclusively. They have stuff for literally every need that you could have. So check the link in the description below if you need a new Linux device. Now, thank you guys for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't hesitate to like and subscribe. And if you didn't enjoy the video, you can dislike and tell me why in the comments. If you don't like YouTube, you can watch all my stuff on Odyssey. And if you want to help support the channel, you can also join my Patreon subscribers and YouTube members, and you'll get access to a weekly Patreon cast and the right to vote on the next topics I'll cover. So thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!